magic. It enchants us, mystifies us, enthralls us, makes us wonder where'd that statue go? And what's more, it's everywhere. These days you can't swing a dead Uruk high without hitting a sexy vampire or a werewolf or what have you. Supernatural elements have become commonplace in pop culture to the point that they're rapidly becoming a cliché if they haven't become one already. Once upon a time, this wasn't the case. It used to be that if your work had a wizard in it, or magic spells or something, it marked it as non-literary, as genre fair, as schlock. But times are changing. What happened? The simplest answer, as you probably already know, is the same thing that happened with comic book movies. Once, comic book movies were few and far between. No one wanted to make them because everyone knew only nerds liked them and that therefore they wouldn't be profitable. Fast forward a decade or so and they're everywhere, making money by the truckload. And now, something similar has happened with fantasy. First, one thing with wizards made money, then another thing with more wizards, then another thing with vampires, and the circle of life continues. Now elements that once marked a work as schlock are at or near peak fad status. On the one hand, this is a good thing. Anything that brings new things out of the genre ghetto will broaden the range of literary possibilities. On the other hand, as supernatural or magical elements in fiction get more commonplace, some of the craftsmanship that made them popular to begin with gets lost in the normalization process. Nowadays, when we ask, why put a wizard in, the answer is often something like, because everyone else is doing it, or because wizards test well in the 18-35 to 35 demographic, or something like that. But these things weren't always true. Back in the day, the question, why put a wizard in, needed a different answer. It needed an answer framed in terms of an artistic trade-off. After all, there are plenty of good stories without wizards, and any time you include a magical or supernatural element in your story, you're asking more of your audience's suspension of disbelief than you would have been otherwise. That's not something you want to do unless you're getting something in return. But what? To answer that question, we're going to hit the way back button to one of my favorite subjects, Tolkien. Tolkien, of course, gave us Gandalf, who to this day is probably the most iconic magic dude ever, and the most widely imitated. Most of the signifiers for the entire archetype are found here. Beard, check. Robes, check. Funny hat, check. Accomplished British actor, check. Whenever characters get this popular, it's worth examining exactly what quality or qualities made them so popular. Your first suspicion might be that Gandalf is a straightforward power fantasy. After all, wouldn't it be cool if you could cast spells and stuff? But this suspicion won't last long once you realize that for a famous wizard, Gandalf doesn't actually do all that much wizarding. Sure, he does some. He can light pine cones on fire and make his staff crystal thingy glow and do some other stuff which is never entirely explained to the audience. But he does these things relatively rarely, and they're usually not decisive in how the stories unfold. This is partly due to the instincts of a savvy storyteller. Tolkien didn't want his companion and call-to-adventure guy overshadowing the protagonists, to the point where Gandalf is actually absent from large chunks of the action. But it's also due to Tolkien's conception of what Gandalf was. If I were to use one word to describe the character, it could be wizard, but it could just as easily be a wanderer. Gandalf's been everywhere and he knows everyone. Elves, dwarves, hobbits, humans, Rohan, Fangorn, Gondor, you name it. His defining characteristic, more so than his magic, is his knowledge. He scours the world, reading its history and lore, and meeting its people. This is not a characteristic separate from his magical abilities. It's one that's intertwined with them. The books repeatedly remind us that central to his power is his staff. Nowadays, the idea of a wizard having a staff is so commonplace that we hardly even notice it anymore. But of course, this wasn't always the case. A staff is a walking stick. It's the implement of a traveler, someone who's been down many long roads and seen many places. By Tolkien's own admission, one of the main inspirations for Gandalf was the so-called wanderer guys of the Norse god Odin. In Norse mythology, Odin would sometimes disguise himself as a familiar-looking bearded man with a staff and a wide-brimmed hat. The traveler, the wanderer, the pilgrim. The parts of our brains that listen to stories are trained to recognize this archetype. By focusing on the staff, Tolkien makes a symbolic link between Gandalf's worldliness and his magical abilities. And when he casts a spell or does anything wizardy at all, it's more than just a trick. It's evocative. After all, magic resides in that blurry place where reality and imagination meet. And we know that that sort of thing doesn't happen around here in Hobbiton. 
but who's to say what happens on the other side of the horizon? That's a place rich with possibility, where the comfortable limits of reality seem, in our minds, to be a bit more flexible. Supernatural elements, when used correctly, have a unique suggestive power. They should trigger that elusive part of our consciousness that doesn't insist that things make rational sense. If they don't, then they strain suspension of disbelief for no good reason. I should note that this runs counter to some of the usual rules of fantasy fiction. Many people will tell you that a fictional universe should be internally consistent. In fact, I myself have said that in previous videos. If you extend this principle to supernatural elements, it follows that they should have defined and consistent rules and boundaries by which they operate. And many people will tell you that they should indeed have those rules. But in my opinion, magic is one area where internal consistency can be bent or simply sidestepped. It doesn't need strict rules and limits, and in some cases is diminished by them. For an example, we'll look away from Gandalf the Good Wizard and towards Saruman, the Evil One. There's a chapter in the Two Towers called The Voice of Saruman. Its events were never entirely depicted in the movies, but in it, Theoden and company attempt to negotiate with the recently defeated Saruman, who nearly turns the tables. Suddenly another voice spoke, low and melodious, its very sound and enchantment. Those who listened unwarily to that voice could seldom report the words that they heard, and if they did, they wondered, for little power remained in them. Mostly, they remembered only that it was a delight to hear the voice speaking. All that it said seemed wise and reasonable, and desire awoke in them by swift agreement to seem wise themselves. When others spoke, they seemed harsh and uncouth by contrast, and if they gainsayed the voice, anger was kindled in the hearts of those under the spell. That's the voice of Saruman, and it's one of the most frightening things I've ever read. Just by speaking, he can turn your friends against you. He can even turn you against yourself. It's an ability that threatens a loss of control, and draws on near-universal folkloric superstitions about the power of language. Would this be as terrifying if we learned that, as a Grandmaster rank Maiar, Sauron is capable of casting a level 8 charm spell and that as a level 14 fighter Theoden has a saving throw of no 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 no. We, the audience, don't understand the methods or limits of Saruman's voice, and that's part of what makes it so unnerving. Remember when we were asking the question, why put a wizard in? This is why. There's a part of our mind, maybe it's the lizard brain, maybe it's racial sense memory, maybe it's just learned superstition, that can be activated by this sort of thing, and make the implausible seem plausible. Incidentally, Tolkien isn't the only author that understood this. There's another one, also quite popular now, who has the exact same middle initials, who writes in a similar mode. That's right, this dude. The Game of Thrones books, and the show, generally keep their supernatural workings behind a screen of mystery. Not only that, but Martin invests them with symbolic weight. They're associated with fire, or shadow, or blood, or ice, and draw on the superstitions surrounding those things. Is it a coincidence that the two most popular fantasy properties, well, ever, both share this quality? I think not. Too often, supernatural elements are made mundane. Too often, magic is used in fantasy the same way technology is used in science fiction, as a tool to expand narrative possibilities and nothing more. Too often, magic is robbed of all its magic. Coming up next, something very different. Here's a sneak preview. Jimmy, at least one aging football commentator was gladdened last night by the sight of an English footballer breaking free of the limpid tentacles of packed Mediterranean defence. I hit the ball first time, and there it was in the back of the net. 